Right, ready? <laughs> Born ready. Hi, welcome to the Sifu Mimi Chan Show. Thanks for joining the conversation. Everybody, the one-two combination of Miosk is back discussing the deep-rooted philosophy of Walam Kung Fu and Tai Chi. We reflect on how our practices often clash with the individualistic mindset prevalent in Western culture. Oscar shed light on the importance of developing trust in your Sifu or instructor and emphasizing that this relationship is built on respect and humility, qualities that are sometimes overshadowed by an American emphasis on self-expression and autonomy. We also discuss the idea that we are not our own individual snowflakes. Fight club, anybody? Well, wait, the first rule of fight club, never mind. Wallam teaches us the value of community, discipline, and understanding our place within a larger whole. This episode is a must listen for anyone looking to deepen their understanding of traditional Kung Fu and its relevance in today's world. I've been enjoying these conversations and hope you have too. If you have, please rate my podcast on your platform of choice and share it with others. If you would like to support with a donation to help keep this podcast going and support the work I do, you can become a patron of the show by visiting my website or patreon.com slash Sifu Mimi Chan. For comments or suggestions, reach out on social media at Sifu Mimi Chan. Now on with the show. Hello, hello, <laughs> Oscar. <laughs> Can we do one more clap? Nice. Or as my, I guess, followers, readers, viewers know you as O. Oh. It actually just came up the other day. I found it interesting because like Mark, our dear friend Mark always says, Oh, how's O? Oh. And, and I was on an interview and someone's like, Oh, your husband, O. Oh. And I realized, Oh, that's because... <laughs> They read what I post, and I always refer to you as O oh, when I write about you in my blogs. Well, you have a lot of thoughts going through your head, so the shorter you can make it, the yeah, reference, the better. Yeah, I, I guess so, and it's like it's not a big secret that <laughs> Oscar is my husband, but for some reason, I guess I just feel like, I don't know, on social media, just to refer to you as O oh, is... A little bit of anonymity or a little bit of like a, maybe just a nickname or, but it's funny because I don't ever call him O just to clarify that because I think people are confused. No, what you, but you do probably 10 times a day when I say something, you go, oh God. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. Well, it is another Miosk episode, everybody. So those of you joining us on YouTube can see the ridiculousness of whatever gesturing is happening here, but also some stretching because as our viewers also know, we are trying to be 40 fit foo, which means in our 40s, staying fit for Kung Fu and martial arts and movement and just staying staying alive basically. But <laughs> essentially, uh, those of you listening, thanks for tuning in and all right, Oscar, take it away. Or, oh, as so many of you know him as by now. You had some thoughts on what we wanted to talk about, so I can't wait to hear them. <laughs> <laughs> as usual, listeners, we are like, basically we're so prepared for this episode, one can say we're over-prepared. Well, it's, if you think of a circle mm -hmm. and this is prepared, we've, we're here, we're moving towards unprepared. <laughs> <laughs> no, so you mean unprepared, preparing so much we're that we come to back to unprepared. That's so what if we're I meant. drawing a, a circle of like an O, then. Like an O. <laughs> if I was more prepared, we would have had a better. But actually, it kind of all works out because it's an O. It's, it is an O, actually. So, yeah, all right. Well, one of the things that we have been doing over the last several months at the Kung Fu School, and I think that people often find our our Wallum world very interesting because it is very unique. I think most of your family members are not involved in a traditional uh, Chinese Kung Fu school, martial arts school, and that just pretty much 24 seven is uh, submerged in that culture, right? Like, would well, let me think. I've got a big, you know? I've got a big family. Let me just go through and see if any your of them. Your mom's like one of 11. Your yeah. dad's like one of three yeah but you know four. lots of cousins four yeah so 
No, I can't think of anyone、okay. who's involved in a、yes. traditional so, Chinese martial arts. So, you、art. know, I think many people then would say that it is an unusual lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. And I think there's a lot of curiosity around that,、uh, being that I just had the pleasure of being on the Monica May radio show here in Orlando. She hit me up with so many different questions from my advocacy to Mulan to Kung Fu. She asked about what is a Sifu, because my podcast named The Sifu Mimi Chan Show. I thought it was so fascinating because it really made me feel a little bit like、um, lifestyle. ADD, like there's just so many different things, and not like I'm this worldly like person that just does so much, or, but I feel like there's definitively in many of the areas that we operate in are atypical to the normal lifestyle, and I think a lot of people also don't necessarily understand what that means, and. One of the things that also resonated as I was reflecting through conversation with her was, yeah, we've been here since 1980. What does that mean? That means educating the community on this kung fu temple in the middle of Orlando, on Goldenrod Road, which literally at the time was in the woods.、Uh, you didn't get here till 94, 5, 95. I moved down 94. 94.、Mm-hmm. So I mean, do you remember what that street looked like? No. Because I was always a type of person who wasn't a wanderer. So <laughs> if I lived on a certain road, and then I had, you know, when I got here, it was mainly going to school. Then that was kind of it, you know, staying in that neighborhood, going to school, coming back. So very much like your Brooklyn days. Would you say that's because of your Brooklyn days that that、no. habit carried over? No, I think、over? it's just the way that I am. Because、uh, my brothers went all over Orlando, I think.、Mm. So I、um, did. They do that in Brooklyn too, though. More so than I did. Right.、Mm. So I'm. Just, I guess what I mean is, it is who you are, but you form that habit also, like from your Brooklyn days, maybe from those experiences that builds that habit, like. I don't know. Is it a product of environment or nature? I guess. I think the person that you are is a product of your genetics, your environment, the nurture that you get,、um, all of it. And so, who I am is an accumulation of all the experiences that I've been surrounded since I was born, and even the genetics of my parents. A lot of it, probably, with what whatever my mom was going through while I was like. In her womb, <laughs> like so. That's really what I, I guess, I feel. But, but, so the person that I am is. That's why you know you, I have three brothers, right? There's four of us, and we're all so different.、Um, because at that point in our lives, and what everything that that we're being bombarded with is what forms us, right? We aren't all four the same,、mm-hmm. even though maybe when we moved down here, we all spoke the same. Mm-hmm. Right, because that's just the, the language. But、mm-hmm. yeah, so、anyway. you didn't, you didn't, you weren't familiar with Goldenrod Road until a little bit later, I would say. But even in the nineties, like it was very different than it is now. Even in the two thousand, all of Orlando was. So, so、yeah. I don't have to think of that specific road. But I guess, I guess a shorter answer would have been like all of Orlando was. Every street that I was in is totally different now. Now it's bigger, more expansive. There's more homes, more businesses. Mm-hmm. There's more people, more traffic. Yeah. So that's what thirty years does. Yeah, and I think in reference to what we do with the traditional Chinese martial arts and having this kung fu temple, it's not even just, oh, we have a gym kung fu school place that's in a plaza, in a mall, or in a a center, right? That's just a storefront. Like it literally is this compound that people confuse for Buddhist temples, Chinese restaurants.、Uh, All sorts of different, you know, thoughts because of I think the architecture of it is quite different. It's got the big yellow wall. There's so much about it that can be confusing, but also, I guess, a presumption is made when you pass by. Like I don't know. I'm I'm actually curious. So, listeners, viewers, people in Central Florida, everybody who's dr- driven by has a thought, right? I'm so curious as to like. What that thought is as you drive by, like what is that, or oh that must be this, or oh that's a really cool artwork on the 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 wall of Walam. So I'm really curious as to what people think because 
I don't know, right? I've just grown up there. So it was my playground. It was my Kung Fu school. It was my after school care area. It was my place of, I mean, I think I spent more hours at the Kung Fu school in my lifetime, possibly, you know, than in my home. So it's just, it's just kind of a place I'm very used to. And I realize as Central Florida has changed, as uh, people start to learn more, there's still so much they don't understand about what a traditional Chinese martial arts school encompasses and embodies and what it means to be a part of it. And I think this is where you and I were having conversations off air, how so many of our students don't necessarily even understand that it is such a big difference between I'm signing up for a XYZ fitness program or the gym or a sports club. And there's nothing wrong with any of all of those things. All of those things are fantastic, but I think the inherent understanding of the culture, the tradition, the etiquette, the expectations behind what this Wallam Temple is, right? Uh, when people come in and even want to be a part of it, we're always very excited, but I think there's just still more education to be done. Like, even though we don't have people coming in and ordering egg rolls anymore, Yay, Central Florida for being able to read for the most part. Uh, even though we have no access to books because there's so many books banned. Okay, had to say that really quick. Um, <laughs> I think that we were talking about, wow, what can we do to better clarify to students, potential students, people who are just driving by, like, what does this mean? Like, what is the Wallam Temple? What are their principles? Like, how does one become a member and what are the expectations? And, you know, I think you can probably give good insight. One, because you weren't born into this. You have been around for over 20 years, so you're pretty entrenched into it. But at the same time, I think you're able to kind of flip back and forth to, this wasn't how I was raised. However, I understand, you know, this is how uh, tradition is upheld here at the school. Yeah. Wow, that was long. So I think it, all inevitably comes down to here in the US, we are always have this um, sense of exceptionalism that is, is the, ex the exceptional is done by the great person. You know, it used to be the great man, I guess, but let's just say the great person, right? Wow, it could be so any, progressive of yeah, you. I'm so progressive, yeah. Um, and so because of that, everyone looks at things through that lens of like they are the great person <laughs> who is 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 about to embark on this journey right and i don't have the specific maybe correlation to make but i i know that in the past eastern philosophies or 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 eastern countries china and, and japan and things like that have a more sense of a collective of um being part of something and that informs you know it goes back to what i said earlier of like all these things inform who you are and how you think and how you approach stuff so you take a person who's coming into a traditional kung fu school and their thought is well my here's my journey that i'm about to embark all true um and then they have to be taught by us sometimes successfully sometimes unsuccessfully that Yes, that's true. You're about to embark on this journey, but you are going to now become a part of something greater than yourself. And so because of that, then you have to then be pliable to certain rules and regulations could be one thing or certain forms of etiquette or certain forms of learning. And if in the Wallam campus, right, if we, we look at it, there's the main thing is the Wallam Kung Fu Temple. There's Control Your Health Wallam Fit. There's the Wallam Cultural Center. But if you look at just the two, Wallam Temple and Control Your Health, most people who come and train and control your health with me, I still foster this, yes, you are special, you are your own individual person, we're gonna cater everything specifically to you. And the communication for someone who is coming into the Wallam Kung Fu Temple into a classroom environment, not individually being taught in, as a private, is yes, we are going to now with all the, the decades of teaching and modern influences, we're going to 
be able to answer questions for you and make adjustments to the classes based on your limitations and your and and capabilities but then also teach them you are also now part of the Wallum family and so that means adhering to certain um, principles philosophies rules all these things and so the I think a challenge that we've had recently with students, new and old students, um, and not I'm not talking and, and new and and ex, and students who've been with us for a long time, is this this thought of, of this this fight that they're continuously having of, but I'm really special though, <laughs> right? Like this goes I'm, back to our reminder, everyone. <laughs> no one is special. Well, well, it's here <laughs> because it's some, we're all special. Right? Well, it's something that I've been trying to see if I could better articulate. Because for a long time, I've always loved the scene from Fight Club yes. where Brad Pitt gives a speech on you are not your own individual snowflake. Yes. Um, uh, it it kind of resonated with me, right? It resonated Even with me too. Even though there's probably some fascist contextually, <laughs> like not just fascist, mm -hmm. but you know that was definitively like mm -hmm. quite a movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but there's I could still go back and really enjoy that movie and really like. A lot of parts of it yes. and also look and go okay there's maybe some things we can question but but all that to say is I've always liked that term and whenever I taught classes kids classes I would always kind of say you are not special you are not your own individual snowflake and over the years what I've learned is when and you know this for a fact because one you've been teaching at Wallum forever but also your experiences with the Sifu Mimi Chan show prove that every single person that you take the time to, to, to speak to and ask questions and find out a little bit about them, that person is very unique. They're special. They are funny and engaging and smart and like kind and all of these things, right? All the kids, I, whenever I talk to them, I'm like, wow, I read this kid's, this is fascinating. I had a conversation with like this six-year-old and it was amazing. Then you go and speak to, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, we have Tai Chi students almost 90 years old and you speak to them and they're completely fascinating. So there's this thought that I, that I don't know if, if I've articulated well, but it's that because every single person is so unique and now you're, you're putting yourself in an environment of a classroom because we consider that we're teaching traditional Chinese martial arts, like sometimes we have 35 students in a class. Yes, every single one of you is special, but because of that and because we're all kind of going towards the same thing, none of you are special. <laughs> so we can't then break different rules because of that, but a lot of students, when we maybe enforce is is the wrong word, but when we remind them of hey, these are you know our rules, our regulations, our philosophies, when we question them on that, they take it as like this affront of like no, but you don't understand my full story because I'm actually really special and I'm a really good person and I don't mean anything bad by what I was doing, um, and so we've had instances, for example, with we have a policy at the temple where. Um, everyone's wearing the same uniform mm -hmm. and some people have passes based on medical clearance right like that you know we t we actually have a student who has one piece of his body grafted to his foot and so he can't wear our kung fu shoes mm -hmm. but then there's other people who just say well you know what i don't like these kung fu shoes so i'm going to go ahead and bring my own shoes thinking that they are special enough to just do that and our thought is well, one, there's rules, right? Like you're part of a, a group. And then two, like you, you know, have a, have a conversation about this. Right. I think this is where, okay, so let me put a pin in that. A couple of things. One is that exceptionalism that you just mentioned. This really circles back to the idea of, and we're, we're being specific, right? Like this is American exceptionalism. We are in America. We love America. We're not criticizing we, as I a whole. I think America is like, exceptional. Like, I think it is exceptional, right? But then the, us as an individual, because of that, should then be entitled to better, different, privileged, whatever word you want to use, treatment. And I think it's important that, like you said, when you do go to be a part of something as a collective and you're joining a team or a family or a culture or you know at the kung fu school we're very familial like all the mm -hmm. names are familial right that you do then respect the um culture the policies the rules however you want to say it of that collective like if you were a soccer player on a team 
I remember it was a million years ago, everybody. But of course, you know, back in in grade school, everybody wanted to be on the soccer team. That was the thing. Like you couldn't just show up in your shorts that you wanted to wear or you didn't play as part of the team. You had to wear the cleats. You had to wear specific socks, even everything, you know, plus I, I grew up in private school. Right. And that was very strict. So I was always kind of conditioned to this way of like, well, in these areas of your life, this is what is required and what we follow. Um, and it was very much simple. If you didn't want to do that, then you weren't a part of that. Right. <laughs> it was pretty simple. Right. And it's it wasn't this. Well, but, but I I'm different. I can be different because, or why would you question me because? So I think there's that exceptionalism that we kind of take to the extreme because we're not calling anyone a bad person if they're not abiding by the principles of the school or they don't want to bow because it is against their religion or it's against their culture or whatever. I was like, bowing is a respect gesture in our culture. And if you don't want to show that respect, then this isn't the place for you. And that's completely your choice. This is also a total tangent, but where you and I get frustrated with people with comedians, where they're like, no, they should never, ever, ever say X, Y, Z or this. And it's like, well, then don't listen to that comedian. If you, you have that choice. You have the option of not listening, tuning in, joining, being a part of. But if you want to be a part of something that has a specification on it, then I think at the beginning of it, you, you just accept that, right? Versus thinking yeah. you're such an exception. Um, the second part of that, of course, is where you know, you're know you talking about you know, people who have a story to share, which is literally everyone. Like you said, everybody wants, I, I'm so grateful now because I get so many people who actually want to be on my podcast versus me like chasing people down and begging. Like I actually have, award-winning writers and people who are like, hey, can I be on your podcast? And and then I don't want to call people everyday humans, but maybe humans who aren't published or people who have are hobbyists or something like that. And they just, I want to be on your podcast. And and it's been really hard because I've had to kind of be a little picky and choosy, but you know, you're always going to be a guest on my, my podcast because you're the podcast co-host and my favorite guest of all time. But uh it's been such a privilege, but literally, like you said, everyone has a story to share. Everybody has something very interesting in their life to share, whether it's how they grew up or how they're, you know, what they cook on a daily basis. Like it's been so incredible to be able to learn, but you're so right in that all these voices, everyone has, you know, something that has been interesting or thought provoking. And I've learned so much from this podcast because of that. And so, yes, love the snowflake scene, fight club. I don't know. It's also a book, of course, first. <laughs> which... There's a line in which I just can't repeat here. So there's a line in the book <laughs> I mean, and, the, and the movie. <laughs> um, and it's almost a challenge of which one is worse. Like which one is more aggressive of a line mm. and I love both of those lines and I'm not going to say them but if you know what they are you can look them up but <laughs> if you know you know yeah if you know you know but <laughs> but um uh in the past I would always just start off with you're not special just get over yourself right which is a little bit harsh right um but I think it's harsh only because the modern day human is a little deconditioned Yes, and, that, I more, think that, and I'm going to say it more sensitive. Yes, I, I, those things are both true, but also because I didn't give them the context of, of what I had said earlier of like, it's because everyone's special. That's why you're not special. You know, like you are an amazing person, but you're not special. Everyone's an amazing person. Um, and I used to just say the, the latter part. And I think mm. kind and of, also that no one cares about you. Which is also true. <laughs> this like, I really believe this. I deep down. <gasps> people care mostly about themselves yes, yes. and every act that they're doing is a way to kind of, you know, make themselves feel better or whatnot. And hopefully whatever that you're doing also helps other people. Mm -hmm. But I, yes, I also believe that most people <laughs> don't care about you. They don't because, um, and we, we didn't steal this per se, but it really resonated when we saw a stand up comic, um, was it Chris Rock? 
And he's like, yeah, tell your kids. Nobody cares about you. Probably even in this house yeah. sometimes, let alone when you go out there. So if you're just preparing your child for you're so special, mm -hmm. everyone cares about you, all of your wants and needs are our are, are number one priority, you're not preparing your child for stepping outside this door. Right. And I, we, I mean, I totally did it injustice, but it's a good bit because there's so much truth to, I hate to say this because it makes me sound like a uh, old person that's being all luxury or something, but yeah, I mean, we just don't prepare our kids, I think, enough for the emotional turmoil and the emotional uh, stakes that are outside their, you know, little safe space. And I, I guess just growing up in a very traditional Chinese and then a very Chinese Jamaican household, you know, there was not a lot of sensory and like censorship and, and holding back from criticism. Growing up in a Chinese martial arts school, I mean, it makes you less sensitive, but I don't think it makes you insensitive. It makes you less... Um, Reactive, maybe. It, it, make, it makes you actually less of the person who's going to be crushed by a certain comment, but also understanding of the power that words have. Mm -hmm. Right. Like mm -hmm. we understand that when you tell a young kid, like, let's say, uh, you know, if I were to reflect back on myself, a uh, 12 year Oscar, wow, you're really skinny. You need to put on muscle like how that can either make them feel very bad about themselves or say, man, you know what? It's true. I got to go do some push ups or some, you know, like both of those things can happen um, so that there is a lot of power there. But when you're around someone like your father who is, says things very factually, like my nickname is Big Head. Dai Tao Jai. Dai tao, like I have a bigger head. Like if, if, if I hadn't heard that for 25 years, right? And the first time I heard it was now at 45, I would be a little sensitive, right? Like he would call someone who's overweight, like fat boy. Like obviously we don't want to, to make people feel really bad, mm -hmm. But that's just him actually being fa factual. If someone had red hair, he'd be like, red hair person, mm -hmm. right? That's just how, how he is. So when you're surrounded by that, um, one, you build a thicker skin. But I think that even the deeper, the bigger picture is that we are, I heard someone say this, so I want to get it right. We are more charitable with where, what his intentions are mm -hmm. because we understand that he's a good person. Mm -hmm. And most of the time it comes to this thing of trust. Like I trust this person. So when they say something, I'm not immediately going to be reactive. I'm going to say, well, where are they coming from? And um, a challenge that we have with, with students, and I think this is more for actually people who are our generation, right? Is because it's very easy to say these young people are sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, they don't realize, we don't realize um, at, the, at the heat of the moment how sensitive we are mm -hmm. when we get called into question about our integrity or something like that. So, so I think these things happen sometimes, you know, to, to bring it all back to our students. This happens sometimes to our students when we say something as simple as, hey, you need to be wearing the uniform, mm -hmm. the shoes that we said that you agreed upon. And some students will be like, oh, that's right. You know what? I didn't even... We actually have some students who've showed up like, I didn't even realize I had these shoes on. And then we've had other students who's like, I, I was actually going to quit because you told me I had to change my shoes, <laughs> right? Oh, we've and, had people quit. And we've had people quit. Oh, yeah. We've and, had people quit. And we have, for something as simple as that. Yeah. Or I, I didn't want to wear my sash or whatever right. it was. Yeah. I didn't want to. Oh, like, oh um, that's okay. That's my, totally My wife choice. signed up my son and now I'm here and I noticed that he has to bow when entering the training hall. Yeah. We don't bow. And it's sort of like, okay, cool. Listen, if you, to, goes back to your point of like, if, if you're not willing to follow what, you know, our philosophies, our teachings, more power to you, but you don't have to be here. You know, it's a choice and it's also a luxury, right? Because it's a, it's a, um, it's another expense on top of everything else. But I, I think I just, I guess the main point I'm trying to make is if we were, if people were to be more trusting of us, as far as like more charitable with, okay, the assumptions I'm making about what your intentions are. If they had a better under feeling of that, then they would understand, well, the reason we have this, there's, there are good reasons behind the reasons that we act, that we mm -hmm. decided to do what we do. And one thing that I 
probably maybe once a day or you know throughout the week five times a week I fail at is having that same thing with other people because I'm very quick to go like to judge and to, to point and I and you know that analogy of there's an angel on your shoulder one shoulder and there's a devil on the other shoulder and you're just gonna be at that moment the person that you listen which one are you gonna listen to I feel that I am the devil on your shoulder because a lot of times I'm like <clears throat> on my shoulder I'm in the particular? devil on your shoulder <laughs> Your instinct is usually to do the right thing, and my instinct is like, no, burn, burn. that guy, or you know, like, forget that, let's do, it, you know, and um, and then upon reflection, I realize that that's probably not the best best thing to do, but again, this goes back also again to how you grew up. Almost always, when you're talking, if we're if we're speaking to a, another couple, let's say we have for dinner, you almost always say. Oh man, we love that book. We enjoy this thing. We do this. And my first in instinct is always saying I. And that goes to how we were raised, right? So um, unless, I, um, unless I was exposed to Wallum Kung Fu and also exposed to you know, the American upbringing and exposed to my heritage, right? Um, and, and then taking the time to reflect upon it, I don't think I would even notice it. Or maybe something would annoy me. But... One, because I've been exposed to it, I have a very charitable assumption of your intentions, <laughs> right? Thank goodness. Um, <laughs> um, it doesn't bother me. Like, I notice it and I go, oh yeah, Mimi just said, we really love that book. And I go, that's true. We really do love that book. We both love that book. But a lot of times if I were in that same conversation, I would say, man, I really love this book. And so right there, as just a couple, we have two different ways of, of communicating something. Mm. And it goes to maybe how we were raised um, and maybe also to why I say that I am the, uh, the devil on your shoulder, right? <laughs> Which is really funny because I feel perception is also really huge here, right? Because I am distinctly like the kids say, you're the principal at the school. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, you know, I walk around and I, and I am also very unapproachable. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie, not, not, um, it, it's very intentional in mm -hmm. terms of, I also can't have a ton of inputs a million times a day because I'm already getting them a million times a day. And so I'm intentionally very, um, distant in terms of like, Hey, I'm going to be your best friend, especially at the school. I've, I think it's a conditioning from a younger sea female sea, being a young being the youngest female sifu almost always right of course now that's that gap's closing i'm not the youngest anymore and i'm i'm not the only female sifu anymore which is also nice not that i was the first or anything like that there were female sifus that older than me um in our system that um you know were my older kung fu sisters but i feel like the fact that i've had to be conditioned to present myself in an intentional way that uh, incurs respect and being, author being an authority because how I kind of look, if you've just saw me in the street, does not fit the Kung Fu master Sifu persona. Like I don't think when you hear the word Kung Fu master, and I've done this in workshops, I've done this in in lectures, everybody is thinking of maybe my father or a, even like, you know, Shaw brothers with the, you know, the long eyebrows and the beard and the Kung Fu robe. And it's almost 90 plus percent sure it's a male. It's never a female. And, and this is one of the questions that Monica had asked me on the podcast the other day in her interview. And I explained the whole Sifu is a male term and how I'm trying to reimagine this and let people hear the Sifu Mimi Chan show and know that that word, I'm kind of claiming it as no, this is uh, gender neutral. And this becomes where it's not just teacher father figure. This is teacher mentor, teacher person who is there for their students, right? Not man that is there for their students, which is, which is what it just traditionally is. Uh, so I think because of my experience, like you're saying, when you grew up, you were born where you were born, who you are because of your parents, your DNA, your environment, what you ate, like what you were around, being 
in a high state of anxiety a lot of times walking to school through the streets of Brooklyn in the crazy, you know, 80s, like a time where it was very dangerous. Like all of my experiences and who I am and have had to become as a Kung Fu, female Kung Fu Sifu is very much, a lot of that still comes through, right? Whereas I feel like I'm finally at a place in my 40s, late 40s now, that I'm not having to prove myself all the time because my work speaks for itself. My students speak for themselves. My, you know, the style is like, we're so established, but that's still piggybacking off of the labor and love and hardships and, and work that my parents laid out, right? Specifically when it comes to Chinese Kung Fu, like my father, right? Like he is who he is. But I think there was also, oh, because I'm his daughter, then I just automatically get all of these privileges. Not that I've had to work for them. It's just a relationship thing. And so I carry all of those things with me on a daily, right? And so there's very intentional that I have to be very careful because if I become that friendly, chummy, I'm your friend person, immediately it, it opens a door for that respect in the classroom to be negated. And it won't happen with, and I'm just gonna say, I've seen it, it won't happen with a male instructor. People are able to, to code switch and go, oh, you know, hey, we can talk about comics with, with Sifu Oscar, but when he teaches class, I'm not gonna be, think he's my friend and I can be casual with him. I mean, some people do, I'm not saying it never happens, but I have learned through my years of experience that as a female Sifu, I cannot be friendly and familiar and your best friend and your next door neighbor type that is in the, in, in, you know, out of the classroom because once I get in the classroom, people do not respect me the same way. And that has been experiential and what my experience has been. I'm not saying that no one can do it because of mm -hmm. course there's always exceptions to the rules, but I think that people maybe don't understand that, right? And they think I'm maybe unfriendly or I am unapproachable or, and of course that, that behavior is also taught. I mean, my parents, neither are way of which are really the most approachable people. But I think that now that we discuss it and reflect on it, like all of those traits are carried over because I'm coming from that place. Yeah, I had um, a 10 year career, almost 10 year career in pharmaceutical sales. Every single one of my direct managers, bosses were women. And I remember other people speaking about them in a way that was derogatory because they were women. And I never had a problem with them because I was always around a strong, female person right i mean um, and for clarity so listeners and, and and audience right like oscar is like we had our relationship initially like we were friends in high school then then we started dating throughout um, after college well after college for me halfway through college for, like during our 2000s right so we met in 96 but we didn't officially like become a couple until like the 2000s uh so we had a very established friendship but then you decided okay well we decided <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be well up now. Like, yeah, here you go. Like, let's go. Um, and so I am technically his Sifu, right? Generationally speaking. Right. And so that is, people ask all the time, like, how do you even do that? Um, that's also my, so, but I cut you off. That's my personality. Yeah. But I, I guess the point I was trying to make is I've seen firsthand that women have to have this balancing act. Women who are in positions of power or authority have to be, have this balancing act where they, they know they're gonna be perceived a certain way when they do something exactly how a man would do it. There's gonna be a perception of, oh, she's a bitch, <laughs> right? And oh, a thousand percent. Right. I can't even, I mean, I probably would be a billionaire if I had a dollar or even a quarter, maybe for every time someone has called me that in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> like, seriously. So, yeah. so, but um, every single one of, I remember one of them saying to me, and it was because she got along with me so well because I had no issues with her, right? Um, I remember her saying, you know, Oscar, like a lot of people think that I'm this person who's like a mean person or, or whatever. Yeah. And she goes, but I have to put this um, persona out mm -hmm. first mm -hmm. so they can see that what I'm capable of and then once they know me I can kind of show what it is and and it goes back to what we said earlier right it's it's that term of like the charitable assumption of what their intentions are unfortunately um, women have have it tougher when they're in a position of power right 
but that's, you know, that's been going on for, for centuries probably. But um, if you get to really know the person, then you'll see, oh, this is where they're coming from. And um, I'm the first one to just be, be quick to judge. I'm, I'm the first one who's quick to judge when I feel that any person, if it's a student, if it's a family member, if I feel that they've misunderstood your intention. Mm -hmm. And so my fault is that I'm like, you know what, burn it. <laughs> that person, I'm like, light them up on fire, burn it, done. And, and I've sliced them off. Yeah. Um, but um, that's because I look at it from, I look at from you from the good intention part. But on the flip side, every single person, we should probably look at it that way of like, take just a beat and go, okay, let me just see where are they coming from? What is their true intention? Most people truly aren't assholes. We, there are. Maybe it's 10%. I don't know. I think 10% is probably a good range of people who are genuinely. Yeah. But again, even though that 10%, they are that way because of all of these things that makes me who I am. All of those things makes that person who they are. I don't, we don't have time to like go deep into each person, right? Because there's only 24 hours in a day. But we can take five seconds to go, all right, this is just who they are. Where are they coming from? They're probably a decent person. Mm -hmm. You know, they maybe don't have the skills to have this communication. So um, this is just a, this is a recurring theme that anytime that I have time to think about, I think about, I reflect on. But during the day, it doesn't happen. I, it's only after I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I, yet again, there I went again and acted this way. When I know upon reflection, and taking a beat that I could have done it probably better. Yeah, and this is the conversation we're always having on empathy, 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 empathy. And if we all had more of it, we would probably have less divisiveness and we would have less of this friction. And I think this is also going back to the student-teacher relationship. I, I know we've done a podcast before on Sifu and what does it mean and really taking in that term and especially in context of the Wallam Temple, like there has to be a trust between the student and the teacher, mainly the student trusting the teacher. Like, why am I doing this riding horse stance and breathing for 15 minutes? Like, well, just trust your teacher. Back in the, in the olden days, you didn't get to ask the questions. You didn't get all these podcasts to explain all the benefits of, you know, this mobility or this exercise or this strength training or all these things. It's just almost too much information, but there has to be a trust. Like you come to the Wallam Temple, you watch a class, you decide, I want to learn this. I see what everyone's doing here. I am going to trust in the process. And it is okay that that trust needs to be built over time, which is why I am actually friendlier to my advanced class students. 1000%. They've earned it. Because they've earned my, they've earned it, my trust as well as I feel like they trust me. They know me already. They know what are my intentions and where am I at? And I teach this way and I'm going to pull the best out of you. I am going to push you to your limits. I am going to be very intentional in how I teach and, and hoping to make the best Wallam Kung Fu martial artist, right? Uh, so I think it's, it's a very much misunderstood, like a miss, I don't know what the word I'm looking for here is, but when you sign up, for example, at Wallam, don't think you realize how much trust you need to put in your coaching team whether that is a 14 year old teenager, whether that is a 50 something year old, you know, instructor. Sometimes I'll tell you that 14 year old teenager actually is more advanced or knows more about teaching than our 50 somethings, right? Like sometimes they've been here doing it longer, have more experience. Uh, I definitely know there's, there's some of our older coaches that would not do the little mantis, you know, five to eight year old class as well as some of our teenagers can run it. Yeah, I think, so um, just, just having that trust, I think, is where people walk in and they don't realize already by signing up, they, they are not relinquishing, but they are agreeing to say, you know what? I do. I trust you to, to, to have your, to, to be here, to be, you know, you are my martial arts education. I'm trusting that. So this is where, again, I'll kind of take a little bit of accountability here where through the influence of trying to grow a fitness business, personal mm -hmm. training fitness business, um, I've influenced the temple in trying to say, hey, we need to be a little bit more um, welcoming and engaging. Um, all these things are true, but um, it's also now we realize that 
we need to then always go back to, well, what is the purpose? This is now switching for Kung Fu, right? Like for while I'm Kung Fu and Tai Chi. Well, what is the purpose? The purpose is to teach traditional Chinese martial arts mm -hmm. and to promote our style. Mm -hmm. That's what our, our purpose of doing it. And that all encompasses not just learning Kung Fu, but also learning the philosophy, the traditions, all, all those things. So we've come to the realization and we're experimenting at the temple with um, being blessed of like, we have a certain amount of students. So anyone who wants to come in as opposed to, great, come in, do you like it? Great, let's, let's get you signed up as a student, is an application process, which is really so that we can immediately start establishing trust mm -hmm. on both sides. Mm -hmm. the, the potential student comes in knowing that yes, this is a welcoming environment taught by diverse students, by diverse uh, t uh, instructors that are empowered by you to, to say, yes, you're, you're able to teach, but that there are all of these also rules and policies that we have in place in order to foster the best possible environment um, to promote traditional Chinese martial arts in a class, in a classroom setting, right? Because it's not, we're not doing private lessons, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's this experiment of like, uh, not just having someone come into the temple and signing them up as a student and making them think, oh, I am a client and you are the product that I'm purchasing. And because of that, I am always right. Yeah, I think that's a, a Western, it's a Western type thing. of um, thought process. So, right? so if the thought can be made more of like all the things we said earlier, yes, you are totally special. You're a precious little snowflake. <laughs> um, but now you're going to come into a system and you're going to be being taught in a fun classroom environment. So then you're part of a bigger group. And so then because of that, you're not special. <laughs> you're still special, but you're not special because of that. Um, and um, I just heard this guy, Danny Meyer, who I, I believe he's the restaurant guy who, who's a restaurateur who... Uh, started Shake Shack, super successful, mm. use a term that they adopted, which is, um, we're going to go with a humble swagger. And I love that because I 100% believe that Walam Temple, Walam Kung Fu Temple, Walam Kung Fu System is the best possible traditional Chinese martial arts that you can get on the planet. Like, I believe that 100%, mm. but it also because we're martial artists, we're gonna do it in a humble way. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna be boisterous about it, right? Like, but, so I you love- You definitely wouldn't put it on like an international podcast. <laughs> yeah. But what I'm, I, I'm saying that, but what I'm saying is when someone comes into the school, I really like the idea of, of having this instilled in myself if I'm talking to a potential student or our team of like, approach it with just humble swagger. Like mm -hmm. know that you have the best possible product but try to be there and understand, you know, where the person is coming from. So I really, I really, I don't know, that kind of, that kind of really spoke to me. And um, the other thing that he said is he prioritizes the importance of things. I didn't write this down, but I, he's like, it's team first, customer second, investors third, or I, I forget, or, or, you know, or, or if it's a restaurant, food quality third and then investors fourth. This is me just off the top of my head remembering. But I immediately thought, that is exactly what you've been doing at the Kung Fu, at Walam Kung Fu Temple, is you've put the team first, which by the way, what, how many, we, well we have as of this week, which is around mid-August, we have about 270 students mm -hmm, around. Mm -hmm. What's our team of instructors? Total? I believe we're at least 20 something. 20. 20 yeah, 20. By the way, Except for one of them, yeah, I don't and count and him. You don't count, and you and you don't count either. But everyone is a volunteer. That's right. And everyone is a student first. Student, a first. paying student. Yes. But you've taken over the years more and more time investing time on the team and making sure that they have not just the technical skills, but these like people skills that will help them, which then puts the student second. And then the, the style, the, you know, what they're learning, third. And then finally, like, investor, like, making money, 
last. It's never the pr it's never our priority at mm -hmm. the temple. Yeah. But because of that, I really think is why the temple is as successful as it is right now. Yeah, is because you put um, that team first of volunteers, <laughs> twenty volunteers. Then, because you've put them first, they are able to help us, all of us together, put the students then next, and then, you know, the curriculum, and then trying to be as successful as we, as we can. Also, like as a business, right? But it's still a school, and if if we kind of can maybe. Maybe I can do a better job of being clearer with it, but communicate this to our team um, and then to, to students as well that, no, actually, you're not the priority. The priority is the team that's going to teach you <laughs> always because once, we, you know, we can't have one student be the focal point of a class of 40. Mm -hmm. We have to think of, of everyone else. And in order to do that, we have to empower the students. So that's a big ramble on from something that I just heard recently, but I, I'm going to take that idea of the humble swagger um, think about it a little bit more because I, I just love that I yeah love that i think that i can see why that res resonates with you in particular as well as someone who's known you more than half your life in terms of your humility who you kind of are but then when you really come into your own with things that you're expert at and i feel like that that's a really good catchphrase for you but it it's really interesting because people are often really surprised when i tell them that we have our entire coaching team, our instructors are all volunteer based and that they're also paying students and that they're also, and I i don't mean just by the students, I mean by other Wallam Sifus throughout, my, mm -hmm. throughout our, our organization. I mean, through other martial arts businesses and things. And I, I, I will say that when we say volunteer, that just means one, they're not monetarily paid, but they are definitely paid, right? So we we structure it very much like an apprenticeship, right? So they are learning a trade. They are definitely um, receiving value for being able to help others and, and kind of we're trying to empower that. And it's, it's an interesting thing because you just said investors or finance or money or whatever is always last and they're like, our lifestyle it's is very much so like that is the the lowest priority on our list of like that is only because we need good food comfortable travel so we can have our our, our hobby right uh, oscar needs his fitness equipment but good weapons you know for swords but like so that's always the lowest priority and clearly our team feels the same like they don't want monetary you know compensation they enjoy i believe the process of learning and that enrichment and understanding more about the system and the time that we spend and invest in them right like so the investment doesn't become monetary it becomes personal it becomes sifa student it becomes building more of that trust giving them more knowledge right and i think that is so like parallel alignment with how do we want the school to run same way we have our instructors and we want them to feel the same way where like we are attracting the exact human that is going to proliferate this art that is going to be able to give that messaging forward that those are the type of people who have empathy and who have the characteristics that we want to build upon our future leaders our future sifus our future instructors and it's super exciting actually for us to see so while in some ways not that we started off negatively but we started off with a little bit of a rant of wow like so many people don't get us it's pretty amazing to see what a high percentage of the people that do get us and how uh, much trust they have in us to help us like with this mission of Wallam. Yeah, and th you know, there's another thing that this person mentioned about percentage of what of the skills that he wants his employees to have. Um, and so we all know IQ, right? Your intelligence quotient. We've all heard of the empathy like one, emotional emotion or emotional yeah. IQ. Um, and he says, I don't understand why we can't have or don't have yet a hospitality a HQ type thing, you know, because he's, he's looking at it as a restauranter and, um, we can take that as like the secondary skills that, that are, our, our assistant instructors are learning. So, so he says the percentage I always want to have is 49% technical skill, 51% HQ or we could call it empathy or, you know, the, the people skills. And again, I think that is the reason why 
um, the assistant instructors that are there at the temple um, are all on a volunteer basis. It's not just, they're getting learning a trade like an apprenticeship of a technical skill, but I still think that's 49.51. I think the 51%, which really makes you feel like you're having an impact, is all the skills that they're getting of learning how to help make other people better people. Yes, I mean, and that is, you, you know, you started off with like, okay, the mission of the Kung Fu Temple is, uh, you know, teach traditional Chinese Kung Fu and, and proliferate that art. That's but 100%, what does that mean? but what does that mean? And I don't think people realize that is not, oh, I can do this really cool sword and spear form. I mean, obviously that's dope, right? To be able to do a cool uh, weapon, but our philosophy and our mission within what does it mean to teach, mean to teach traditional Walam martial arts is kindness, fellowship, hard work, respect, patience, empathy, right? And those are those are the things. That's the 51%. So, so that yeah. is really kind of to bring us into a circle incredible that we're, you know, kind of you know, I don't know if listeners are going to know this, but we didn't actually plan this conversation. <laughs> no, but but, um, but we talk so much, right? We talk so, so much about this, yeah. and um, but it, it's a really great brainstorming. Like, wow, this really does kind of all fit together in the way of which all the philosophies we're talking about. Like, it's in such alignment. Yeah, when I going back to like my first pharmaceutical job it was with Eli Lilly, mm -hmm. and I was in Indianapolis doing training. There's a lot of things that I don't remember from that training, but one thing that is super clear is they were. You know, there was, it was a classroom environment and there was two teachers who were teaching us all about the, uh, the drugs that we were going to be selling, mm -hmm. but also the science behind it. But um, there was one um, practice that we did, which they started with the end in mind, which is the end is, and the world will be a better place. So it was a selling type of skill, but it was like, doctor, um, the reason why you want to prescribe this pill is because then it'll make the patient better, but then this, then this, then this, then this, and then eventually, why? Because it, it'll make the world mm -hmm. a better place. And that just is a memory that just came to mind while we were talking about this of like- 1% better. Well, the, not just the 1% better, but but um, uh, the end in mind is we want to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. Our Through vehicle, better humans. Yeah. Through better humans. So we're going yeah. backwards now, through better yeah. humans, through tradition, teaching traditional Kung Fu, Kung Fu but- mm -hmm. Really, the end in mind is like, yo, we everyone wants to like live in a good, in a happy world and, and be, but it starts with like, how can we change people to become the best versions of themselves? Um, and our vehicle for doing that is Kung Fu and Tai Chi. Um, and uh, but you know, that's kind of like, like you said, not the most important thing. The most important thing is, is that is that end point. And so, we've had students who, who've left after just being with us for a year or so yeah. and, and have had that impact. and Because they don't want the world to be a better place. That's why they leave. No, no, no I'm no, just kidding. Some maybe, well, some it's just not the right fit. <laughs> no, I'm but, teasing. But, uh, but um, have come back and yeah. we've been shocked and we're like, wow, this person. So in, in any case, I, I guess that's, you know, we started off with negativity and circled around <laughs> to positivity back to a little bit of negativity, all the way back to positive. We did more than a, a full circle. Okay, oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I think we'll leave it there today. And I would love to hear from listeners, viewers, uh, what their thoughts are, or if they're in a organization or a uh, team or something that kind of gives you this sense of all of the things that we're talking about in the philosophies and how that maybe relates to your art form or your sport or your uh, place of practice and because I really do feel and I know that I'm biased but Wallam is a really special place because we are all special and nobody, <laughs> nobody's special but I do feel like it is super unique in, a, in an effect of we do have a full volunteer team we have people who are passionate that want to be there and, and that energy comes through and the reason that we are there is definitely to make better humans not just of others but also of ourselves yeah, mainly so, the betterment of ourselves. And by doing that, all the other things hopefully happen too. So just while I'm students, just wear your uniform and apply by the policies. <laughs> which is um, part of our philosophy. If you know, you know, and that's part of it.
that Jinjo Jin Si Jin Gado, right? Like that's, people just repeat things that they say all the time is, is respect your teachings, respect your sifus. This is, this is what's being told by your sifus. And so sometimes you just have to understand to trust your sifus, I think is, is the bottom line there too. Love it. Love it. I thought you were going to like clap. All right. That's a wrap. We'll see you all next time. Thank you for another Miyask episode. Bye. That's all for today's episode. Thanks for listening to the Sifu Mimi Chan Show. Please subscribe and rate my podcast on your platform of choice and leave a review. You can become a patron of the show at patreon.com slash Sifu Mimi Chan to help keep this podcast going. Follow me and interact on social media at Sifu Mimi Chan on Instagram or Facebook.